starring Irene Dunn on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. Tonight, DuPont welcomes to Cavalcade's Hollywood Playhouse one of our very favorite stars of stage and motion pictures, lovely Irene Dunn, in the unforgettable role she created in the RKO motion picture, Cimarron, adapted from Edna Ferber's thrilling novel of the same title. And now the lights are being dimmed as the curtain goes up on Cimarron with Irene Dunn. Tonight's play on the Cavalcade of America. Oklahoma, land of the forest, the waving sea of grass. Oklahoma, the Indian country, crossed by Coronado, questing for gold, by French trappers broaching west from Louisiana, and always there were Indians. Then came the settlers, pushing the Indians further and further west, swarming across borders to the lush, fertile plains between the turbulent Cimarron and the roaring Canadians. In 1889, Washington realized these land-starved pioneers could no longer be denied. So President Harrison signed the proclamation, and the Indian territory was open. At noon, April 22nd of that fateful year, by the thousands they stood poised at the border, all breathlessly awaiting the signal which would send them reaching into the territory to claim land, land for their own. The hand on a soldier's watch ticked on toward the noon hour. 1157, 1158, 1159, and... April 29th, one week later, in the cool, quiet home of her parents in Wichita, Sabra Cravat stands reading aloud a letter written from the new town of Osage by her husband, Yancey, describing the new territory. By nightfall, there wasn't an acre, Sabra. Not an acre left of the two million opened at noon. Sabra, sugar, there has never been anything like that run since creation. History made in an hour, like a miracle out of the Old Testament. <laughs> Sounds just yeah. like Yancey Cravat. The tongue of a bishop and the soul of a buccaneer. Oh, Mother, please. You want me to finish the letter, don't you? Oh, why I ever let you marry a man like that, I'll never know. Rhapsodizing over Oklahoma. You Filthy might be Indian. interested to know that Yancey's going to publish a newspaper in Osage. And when he gets back here next week, little Sim and I are returning to Oklahoma with him. Sabra. Sabra, are you out of your mind? Oklahoma? Why, I, I simply forbid it. Oh, forbid it or not, Mom, I'm going. Yancey's right. There's an empire to be had and to be tamed. And if that's the life my husband chooses, then his wife and son will be with him when those wagons roll into Osage. <laughs> Why, Yancey, is this Osage? Osage it is, sugar, in all its glory. A month ago, a crawling red prairie, today a rip-roaring town. You're all right, it's a, a rip-roaring town, all right. That was just Osage's way of saying, welcome, stranger. Oh, but Yancey, it's... Come so... on, sugar. You'll feel different after you've seen the little newspaper plant I got here for us. Now, let me get off here. Yeah. Feels good to stretch my legs. Come on, honey, jump down. I'll catch you. There. There we are. Now, hang on. Got to open this door. Yeah. Abra, Mrs. Cravat, welcome to your new home. <laughs> well, silly, aren't you going to let me get down? When you hire a carriage, you generally pay your cabby fare, don't you, sugar? Hire a what? Oh, yes, you really know these I stories. carried you in from the wagon, didn't I? A nice, safe trip, if I say so myself. Oh, dearest, all that for a kiss you could have had just for the taking. <laughs> now, help yourself to a look around your home. Oh. Oh, Yancey, you mean we have to live here? 
Behind those printing presses? Sugar, I know it's no Wichita Palace, but you'll make it one for the three of us. First thing we got to do is start publishing the Osage Wigwam. But once the paper's out, we'll have time and money for everything. Well, when I hear you say it, Yancey, I feel pretty sure, but when I start looking around, Oh, I... little Sabra. If I'd been half a man, I wouldn't have dragged you and Sam off here, but... Oh, Sugar, I couldn't have left you in Kansas. I love you so much, just the thought of not having you. Oh, darling, darling, darling. <laughs> maybe, maybe you and Sim should go back to Wichita. This is a hard and callous country for a woman. No, yes. No, my husband. Whither thou goest, darling, forever. Oh, if there wasn't anything else I loved you for, Sabra, I'd worship you for that. <laughs> Anybody at home? Hey, Grant, in here. Well, hiya, Yancey, you old lop-eared buffalo. Oh, I beg your pardon, ma'am. Grat, I want you to meet my wife, Sabra. This is Grat Nolan, honey. How do you do, Mr. Nolan? Mr. Nolan, she says. <laughs> ma'am, that's the first time I've been called Mr. since that Texas judge gave me five years for rustling. <laughs> you mean that... Oh, you're, now, you're... don't mind Grat, sugar. If the judge had known his business, Grat had gotten life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good one, that's a good one. Uh, by the way, Yancey. Yeah? Remember I told you about Jack Pigler, the fellow who tried to run a newspaper here and was killed? A newspaper man killed? Oh, I'll say, brother. And what are you aiming to say, Grant? Well, from what I've been hearing while you were east, if I was you, I'd just forget about trying to pin the killing of Jack Pigler on the Yonders gang. Well, Grant, somebody around here has got to tell the truth. And if Lon Yontis thinks Yancy, he can get away... Yes, see, Mr. Nolan's trying to tell you this because because he's heard something. You did hear something, didn't you, Mr. Nolan? Well, uh... Someone's threatening to, to shoot my husband. Sabra, he... I've worn these guns for a good many years. I'll be wearing them while Lon Yontis is roosting in Boot Hill if I can prove who killed Jack Pegler. Well, all I can do is warn you, Yancey. Lon Yontis is on the prod up the street swearing he's going to gun you down. Thanks, Grant. If you see Lon, tell him I'm waiting. Oh, all right, Yancey. See you later. Yancey, what sort of a town is this? And what sort of a man are you that you'd make yourself a target for a gunman's bullet? I only know what sort of a man I'd be if I let Yontis get away with his blood. Yancey, now, no. You've got to promise me. You've got to be careful. Yancey. I didn't come out. Yancey! Yontis and his gang are up the street and they're headed this way. I'm right here waiting. Oh, Yancey, don't. Don't go out there. Please, well, don't. Well, so you finally got back here, I thought maybe I'd miss the place. I'm back, Lon. But I, what I've got to take up with you will have to wait. What I've got for you won't wait. Or maybe you'd rather stand there behind your missus. Why, don't you missus me, you good-for-nothing loafer. You leave my husband alone hey, or you're going to... Hey, why don't you throw away them shooting iron cravats? You don't need two guns. you got two apron strings. Come on, boys. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It'll be all over town in ten minutes that Yancey Cravat hides behind a woman's petticoat. Well, let them say it. You can't run a newspaper dead, can you? And after seeing him, I've decided Osage needs our newspaper. Sabre, you mean that about the newspaper? Yes, I do. I certainly do. All right, sugar. We'll start right now. And the first thing we'll do is print the name of the man who killed Jack Pegg. Oh, no, wait, Yancey. You can't do it that way. And why not? We're going to print the truth, Sabre. No, no, no. Now, look, we need help. Don't you see? We need the support of the whole town. We've got to make them see that we're not afraid. So they won't be afraid anymore. Sure, sure, but now, how if you... we could only get them together at a sort of a meeting, like a, a, a church meeting. They wouldn't dare stay away from that. A church in Osage, but there isn't any. Well, uh, uh, maybe it's kind of unholy sounding, but uh, my saloon will hold close to 300 people if you'd care Church? To... In a saloon? Well, of course. What difference does that make? You said yourself, where well, his word is spoken is his temple, and you'll be the preacher. You always were a good talker. All right, Sabra, I'll do it. We'll print up a bulletin today, the largest type we've got, and post it on the front of the Red Dog Saloon. Come, all ye faithful. Morning, Jim. Don't take a 
seat anywhere. Thank you, Take Mom. your hat off, please. Uh, reckon you can baptize me in a saloon, Yancey? If you don't keep quiet, I'll baptize you with a bottle of rye. <laughs> I'll take up the direction, Reverend. I'll commission. <laughs> All right. Quiet, please. Now, settle down. Yes, he look. Here comes the artist and his gang. Let him. Let him throw the first stone. Oh, darling, you don't He's think... He's enough. You might find that the Lord's sword is too edged. Come on, Faber. Church is about to come in. Friends? Friends? We've come to the first service in this Osage Methodist Catholic Baptist Episcopal Lutheran Congregational Church. My text is from Proverbs. There is a lion in the way. A lion is in the street. But since I'm going to change the word lion to jackal and name a few names, anyone who wishes to leave may leave now. Good. Now, friends, perhaps I made a mistake in saying jackal. Perhaps I should say skunk. Because it is a skunk who has held this town abjectly terrorized by his threats of sudden death. But today I'm going to name that skunk the murderer who shot down our former newspaper editor when his back was turned. He's in this tent now, and his name is... Yes, Lord... look out, he's gone! What? Hello, citizen. You all saw it? I shot Lon Yonders in self-defense. Are we going to let a murderer stand behind a puppet? This meeting was just a trick to get the artist where Cravat could gun him down. Oh, oh, oh. Stop playing that organ. Stop playing that. Sugar. Sabra, lead them in the hymn. Sing, Sabra, for the Lord's sake, sing. ever held in Osage, as depicted in Cimarron, Edna Ferber's epic of Oklahoma. Cimarron, starring Irene Dunn, is brought to you this evening on The Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. Four years have passed since Sabre arrived in Osage. Four years during which Sabre has worked side by side with her roistering gifted husband. It is late afternoon, and Sabra is editing the weekly edition of the Wigwam when the door opens. Got a proof yet on the front page? No, not quite, Yancey. Why? Good. I'm going to write a sizzling editorial. It's high time Osage buckled on her guns and did something about the Pinto kid. Oh, Yancey, why must you always be the one who looks for trouble? We have law officers here. They've had their chance. Now I'm going to take mine. You mean you're growing bored with Osage now that it's settling down? The fact that the Pinto kid is a cold-blooded killer and might kill you means nothing to you. Nothing? Where right is concerned? Right. I have a few rights. The rights of a wife and a mother. Your son has some rights. No, Sugar, don't get upset over I'm not nothing. getting upset. I am upset. There's something in your blood, Yancey. Lord help you. Never let you rest. You've always boasted how you could never stay in one place for more than a few years. You start jobs and leave them half done the moment the danger's out of them. That's only because this land of ours is filled with a thousand frontiers, ten thousand jobs to be done, and only a handful of us to do them. Jobs like making a target of yourself for outlaws and bullets? No, Yancey. This time I mean it. You touch your guns, and I'm taking Sim and going back to Wichita. You wouldn't. There's still too much to be done here. Well, you can't bluff me down this time, Yancey Cravat. I'll leave for Wichita tomorrow if you don't give me your solemn promise never to touch a gun again. All right, sugar. I'll see that you get your ticket. Yancey, you... You go back. Try and live down the shame of leaving Oklahoma half finished. Oh, oh, Yancey. You know I couldn't go. Remember what I, what I told you the first day I set foot in this room? Whither thou goest, I go forever. 
Save her. Stainless, timeless woman. My only love. Oh, darling, please. You're squeezing me to death. I'm not squeezing, sugar. I'm just clinging to you. You're like a strong, straight bower and my love of thine trying to clothe you in all its twining fragrance. Ah, oh, and I suppose that is Shakespeare? No. That's just plain Yancey Cravat. Oh. oh. that, ma'am, here's all the proof of this week's edition. Well, thanks, Mr. Simmons. Uh, excuse me, ma'am, but it's uh, more than an hour past press time now. And yes, uh, yes. Mm, and someone better start putting the paper together. And Mr. Cravat will take care of that when he returns. Oh, Miss Cravat, it'll be just like last week all over again when he didn't come around till next day. I didn't ask your advice, Mr. Simmons. Yes, ma'am. Only couldn't we sort of start making it up? Now, here's the feature story, the one you wrote commemorating the territory's fifth birthday. Hmm. Five years. Five years in Osage. And that story about the ladies' auxiliary's new club room and the tea social on Sunday. Hey, bro. Again, they just... Sugar, oh, wait you here. Yancey, where have you been? The paper's all ready to go. Oh, hang the paper, Sabra. I got news, real news. You seem to forget we have a paper to get out. It's your I job. I know, Sugar, but, but listen... President Cleveland just signed the proclamation an hour ago, opening up the Cherokee Strip Cherokee for settlement. Six million three hundred thousand acres purchased from the Cherokees and thrown open for white settlement. Oh, honey, let you and Sim and I get out of this. Lord, sewing clubs and church suppers and wallpaper and Paris fashions. Oh, see, it's just like Chicago Yancy, now. Cravat, are you serious? Sugar, we'll sell the paper, pack our things, make the run, have a ranch with horses and steers. Never, and I won't. I won't go. I'd rather die first. Never, Yancey, and you can't make Honey, it. Honey, you don't understand. It's the biggest thing in the history of Oklahoma. Down, we... down history and Oklahoma. I don't want anything but a few years of happiness and comfort with my family. Oh, Yancey, yes. Avery, you've got to listen to me. No, no, I mustn't listen to you. The trouble is I've listened to you too often. You're not a man, Yancey Cravat. You're not even a husband. All you are is a shiftless, selfish page out of a lying history book you want to write yourself. You won't go with me? Sir? You know I won't go. I don't believe you'll go either. There, Sabre, is where you're mistaken. It isn't that I will or will not go. If I were here when that gun went off and the Cherokee run started, that bullet would go through my heart. And you could bury me alongside the Pinto kid. You're stubborn. Stubborn, that's what you are. You won't even give your own wife and son one precious bit of yourself, but without making them pay a price, your price. I hate to leave having you think that of me, sugar. Hate you worse than anything. But the paper and all I've got is yours. May God keep you till I get back. And so Yancey vanishes down the road of his destiny to be swallowed up as the years march on. Silver has now touched the hair of beautiful Sabre for that, a successful, influential woman who has helped guide Oklahoma to become a state of the Union. Then, on the night of Oklahoma's first national election, seated behind the editor's desk of the Osage Daily Wigwam, Sabre looks up as the door opens. Howdy, Mom. Why, Simmy, what on earth are you doing here? Shouldn't you be home working on those examinations? Oh, how could I study when my mother is about to become the first congresswoman in history? How do the returns look? Pretty good, son. In fact, I'm beginning to be a little frightened. You frightened? Well, I've seen you in there battling everybody single-handed too long. I know. Well, it's not really frightening. It's... Oh, I don't know. I guess it's a disappointment. All these years I've worked have been only because... because I thought your father would be back. Mom, he would, if he were alive. You see, son, I wanted him to be the first congressman from Osage. He loved this country so much. So, Mr. Cravat, Mr. Cravat. Yes, what is it, Mr. Simmons? It's just come in, the last return. You're it, Mr. Cravat. You're the new congressman. Oh, Mom, gosh, I'm proud of you. The first congresswoman in history. Oh, oh. What? Well, what's the matter, Mrs. Cravat? Mom, Mom, you've been overdoing it. You, you better come home now. No, no, I'm all right. I'm sorry, I... 
I'm acting just the way your father would expect a woman to act at a time like this. Oh, Sabra, Sabra, we've just come from campaign headquarters. Sabra, my dear, congratulations. Isn't it wonderful? Is, is it? <laughs> I don't know. Why, darling, of course it is. And we've planned so many things for you before you leave for Washington. Mr. Oakes wants you to attend a luncheon as honorary chairwoman next Wednesday when they bring in the first well in the new Pahuska oil field. Oh, imagine what an occasion. And the hotel is catering a luncheon right out in the oil field itself. And for our chief speaker, we'll have Congresswoman Sabra Cravat. <laughs> And now, friends, I give you as our guest of honor, the editor of our leading paper, whose loyalty and devotion to Oklahoma set an example for all to follow. Our new congresswoman, Sabra Cravat. Thank you, Mr. Oakes. And thank you from the bottom of my heart, my dear, dear friends. Many of us here today have watched Oklahoma grow from a savage wilderness. We have seen schools and churches, roads, replace lawless frontiers. My part in all this, everything I've done, everything I will ever do, has been merely building on the glorious blueprint of progress drawn for me the first day I came to Osage. Drawn by my beloved husband, Oklahoma's true leader, Yancy Cravat. <laughs> On the day the territory was open, Yancy wrote me. What's that? Everyone, oh, that? everyone that don't eat for alarm. What's up? What's happening? I, I don't know yet. I think everything's going. <laughs> Did you see what happened? Well, I know. You well blew in and knocked over the deal. No. If some old galoot hadn't thrown his body against the timbers till they all got out, the whole crew would have been crushed to death. How terrible. Was the man hurt? I'm afraid so, ma'am. Part of the dirt fell right on him. But he sure was a hero. Oh, well, I'll go see what I no, can do. No, you're going over there, ma'am. Oh, Yance is past any helping. Oh, oh, Yance. Did, did you say yes? Yes, ma'am. Oh, my God. <laughs> Yancy. Yancy. Sabra. Oh, Yancy. My always all. My darling. Sugar. Don't cry. Please. Oh, Yancy, where have you been? There was so much for us to do together. We did everything we had to do together. All those plans you had, darling. Oklahoma. Oh, you've done the job better than I could have, sugar. No, Yancey, darling. It's you and men like you who build the world. Build it for the rest of us to live in. You've got to get well, Yancey. Got to. No, sugar. Wife and mother. Stainless woman. Hide me. Hide me in your love. Sleep. Sleep, my boy. My dearest boy. Gentlemen, in a few moments, our star, Irene Dunn, will return to the microphone. Meanwhile, Gain Whitman has some interesting information about color. At night, runs the proverb, all cats are gray. Pretend for a moment that you had it in your power to decide what color all cats should be. If you held up your finger and said gray, 
All cats would be gray. Would you do it? Well, why not? A gray cat is a perfectly good cat. But the chances are that if you had your say-so, you'd keep right on turning out 1942 model cats in the usual colors. You might even brighten them a bit with pink or green. Why? Because a world without color is a dreary, dreary place. And all of us know that's so. Thirty years ago, curtains, table linen, shirts were always white. Shoes were black, white, brown, or gray. Men's suits were black or blue. Stockings were black or white. Our fathers and mothers lived in the white and black world of a photograph. Well, again, why not? Why do we enjoy so many colors today? The answer, as before, is that there are values in this world that have nothing whatever to do with utility. Some feeling deep inside us tells us that a colorful world is not only a gayer, pleasanter place, but a better place. The sky is blue, the grass is green, little chicks are yellow, and when it comes to color, butterflies combine the most gorgeous colors we know. So today, we use color, lots of it. We have it to use. We have it largely because modern chemistry provides us with it. The DuPont Company, for example, manufactures paints and dyes in hundreds of base colors, which through various formulations may be extended to an almost infinite number of shades. Some of them serve plain purposes. They go into carbon paper and stove polish and printing ink. Every piece of white paper has a little blue in it to make it look whiter. But thousands of colors are dedicated to one thing and one thing alone, the pursuit of happiness. Paints brighten the walls of our homes, our offices. Food colors make the things we eat and drink more attractive. Dyes assure women an endless supply of dresses never twice the same. Color in our time doesn't merely gloss over the surface of an object that might otherwise be ugly. It's an integral part of our lives. Color used for the joy of itself. Color as free as that note of pure joy on the part of creation, the butterfly's jeweled wing. Such a contribution to the happiness of mankind can't be weighed or measured, but the DuPont chemist, who has done his share to provide it, feels that the colors he creates are among the better things for better living through chemistry. And now we'd like you to meet our star, Irene Dunn. It made me very happy tonight to return to my old love, Simran, on the Cavalcade of America. It was that picture that gave me the opportunity every actress dreams of. I hope that the qualities I admire so much in Sabre Cravath will always find affection in the hearts of men and women. To me, she is a very real American. Thank you. Thank you, Irene Dunn. It's been a pleasure to have you with us on Cavalcade, and we hope you'll be back again soon. By the way, be sure to listen next Monday evening when we will present Francho Tone in Sidney Kingsley's Pulitzer Prize-winning play, Men in White. I shan't miss it, you can be sure, John. Thanks again, everybody. Good night. Part of Miss Dunn, Yancey Cravat was played by Gail Gordon. Tonight's radio version of Cimarron was written especially for Cavalcade of America by Paul Franklin. The original music was composed and directed by Robert Armbruster. Be sure to listen next Monday evening when the Cavalcade of America stars Francho Tone in Men in White, the thrilling play which dramatically portrays the courage and faith exemplified in the daily work of American doctors and nurses. Your announcer is John Heaston, sending you best wishes from DuPont. This is the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company.